Prince Abonnet. Alright guys. Happy New Year to you all, as I just said. I'm not going to mess about. Time for the New Year's answers. So, let's get going. Seb0495 says, Sam, I'd be interested to hear your opinions regarding the notion of self-defence within current legislation. It seems to me that it carries absolutely no weight whatsoever. The idea that the possession of a firearm, knife, or any other tool for that specific purpose is completely out of the question. I don't know about you, but I find that hard to get my head round, um, given our not so insignificant violent, violent crime stats. Apparently, personal responsibility is a luxury we're no longer afforded. Thanks. Merry Christmas, Seb. Yeah, it's interesting, wasn't it? Um, I can understand the notion, certainly from an average person, not wanting you know, every person in the UK who can, armed with a handgun to defend themselves willy-nilly. And I can understand how, you know, you could, you know, theoretically perceive that as a little bit paranoid, given that people are armed in the UK. But it is a fact that it is a very, very, this is a very violent country. And in fact, overall, violent crime is probably higher than the United States. Um, certainly, you know, as you saw in one of my previous videos, in terms of the, the culture of people getting pissed out of their faces and beating each other up on a Saturday night, is, is very common. So I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Um, I think for concealed carry purposes, I can definitely see an argument for um, if you're going to have that with a firearm, for it to be a lot stricter than, say, in the United States. Uh, mostly because, you know, there's, there's, I mean, certainly from a perspective of what other people are going to feel about it, you know, um, people should be properly trained basically. And a lot of states in the state in, in America are. And, it, it, and from a UK perspective, certainly currently, um, people who are members of gun clubs go through more vet, vetting and checking than, you know, an armed response unit officer does. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see, see a problem, really. If somebody is has gone through all of the correct criteria to train themselves to, to be in the possession of a firearm in a public place for the purposes of self-defence, I don't see a problem. I think what it comes down to is, because again, you know, my gut feeling as I'm saying this, you might hear some trepidation in my voice, is that it does smack, I have to say, it does smack a bit of being a little bit paranoid in everyday life. It does, from a UK perspective, simply because the chances are somebody you come across isn't going to be armed. However, it shouldn't really matter, should it? Because we should be judging people based upon their actions, not upon, you know, their lifestyle choices. You know, if somebody wants to walk around with a knife or a gun or anything else, 24 hours a day, um, until they do something wrong, they've not done anything wrong, have they? Is this a question of the way you perceive the world? It's a question of world view. Are you somebody who values liberty or are you somebody who thinks that the state and the, the population have a right to take, to sort of impose their world view upon you, you know? When you do something that's wrong or could be perceived as wrong judge you you should be judged then not beforehand like you know if someone breaks into your house certainly i mean that's a different issue from everyday walking around self-defense so what breaks into your house frankly i think that you should be able to use lethal force not only protect yourself and your family but to protect your property because it's your home it's your you know it's your residence nobody's got a right to do that to you. Nobody's got a right to come into your home. And maybe if they, if they knew that you were allowed to, to use lethal force, they'd think twice before they did it. But so there is, you know, there's a bit of nuance here. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I think, really, to be honest. I think people should be judged at the time upon the action. If somebody carries a knife, that shouldn't be a, cr a crime at all. Um, and if they have a gun, provided they've gone through the right checking, there shouldn't be a problem with that either. The time to, 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 to sort of make a judgment upon their behaviour is when they come to use that knife or that gun. And if they use it in an irresponsible way and they take a life, either deliberately or by accident, then judge them then, just like we do with the police. It does seem strange to me in that respect how a lot of people in the UK almost see the police, for instance, as being somehow superhuman, as if they're not the, like the rest of us. I mean, they are civilians. And yet, nobody would question the police. I mean, certainly with the police now, if they accidentally shoot someone, or when they do shoot someone in a crime situation, you know, most people back the police and say, well, you know, if, you, if they carry guns, then you should back them. So, you know, wh why are they different to anyone else, provided they've had the right checks and balances? I hope that's not a bit rambling. But yeah, that's what I sort of think. Let's move on. 
Uh, Get953 says, what rifle are you planning to buy next? What shotgun are you planning to buy next? I have to say, I'm not really planning on buying a shotgun in the near future, given the fact that I've got very nice over and under, and I've got a very functional um, wet weather and, and um, practical pump action shotgun. So it's not something I'm thinking about particularly. Um, having said that, you know, sometime in the future it might be nice to buy a side by side of some sort, maybe a 20 bore. Having used a 20 bore recently, um, I must admit they're great little guns to be honest. Even with a really heavy load, the recoil isn't that bad. Um, and they can be quite small and compact and pointable and nice to use. In terms of rifles, uh, I, I want to get a centerfire of some sort. Um, on my ticket I've got a 243 for deer. I have deer that I can shoot, so I'm probably going to go with that. Um, it's just money really. I could pick up um, a 243 of some sort for maybe, you know, six, seven hundred quid with a scope with it, second hand. But as you probably know, I like to buy my guns new. And if I'm buying a rifle like that, I want a really nice piece of glass on it. I want to spend at least five or six hundred pounds on like a Zeiss or um, something like or something like that. And then obviously then there's the cost of the gun and brand new, you're talking about another eight hundred quid. So at that point you're talking like fifteen hundred quid or so for the sort of setup. So it's a question of getting the money together, really. But that's what I'm looking at. Uh, next we have uh, Volklak asks, why is the UK so restrictive when it comes to hunting and firearms ownership? Why can't you hunt on government owned land like you can in a lot of other countries? Well, it's a simple answer, really. The government don't really own any land, really. Um, and what land they do own, yeah, they're restricted. But you've got to remember, we live in a nanny state, unfortunately. The public, um, you know, they don't really get the concept of having rights in the UK or liberties or other people having rights and people tend to be quite ignorant in terms of being very inconsistent with the way they look at the world. I mean a classic example would be recently when, I mean this is going on a tangent slightly, but when the Tories were planning on taking away um, what's known as child tax credits where you get free money basically just because you've got a kid and you know lots of people were up in arms about it. But previous to that the same government had been, I mean, bearing in mind, these people could be earning 50 to 60,000 pounds a year and still get it. They don't need that money. But at the same time, before that, the government were taking away money from disabled people and making people with quite severe disabilities, instead of just going to their doctor and their doctor assessing them and then telling the government they needed money, they're making them go up against a panel of like eight people and sort of publicly humiliating them and making them essentially stand there in front of eight people and sort of explain why they're so, you know, that they're so pathetic and inadequate that they couldn't possibly work. To humiliate them like that meant that most, a um, very large number of them wouldn't, wouldn't go and then would get their benefits taken away. And a significant number of them killed themselves because of it. And those same, I hate to say the word, but arsehole people who were worried about their tax credits couldn't give a, a shit about them. And those same people have that mentality about everything else. They only care about what affects them. They don't care about other people. So if it comes to a liberty for them, they'll be all upset about it. But if the same principle applies to someone else, like with firearms or with hunting, they think, well, I don't do that, so I just don't give a shit. And that's what we, that's what we have to deal with. I think what we really need to do is we need to have politicians who've got more integrity, who are willing to, to call the public on their bullshit and explain this to them. And I think actually a lot of people would have more respect for them. Because, you know, where's, where's the commonality here? Why, what right have I got to ask for a right and then try and deny what is essentially the same right to someone else? So, yeah, that's why it is. We do have some public land, but it's not like Europe or in the States where you put an orange hat and buy a permit and go and hunt. You need to know someone, you need to be friends with them or whatever, and you need to get permission to shoot. And yeah, it's not good. It's not good for the sport. It's not good for, for it's not, to be honest, good for, for wildlife management either. The Forest of Dean, for instance, have loads of boar. Can't really shoot them. I mean, I think there is a way, but it's very, very, very difficult sort of to do it. Or we have the badger call that happened recently. The government could have sold permits to do that, and it could have made money out of it. But instead, this is the mentality we deal with here. The government actually paid people to shoot badgers, which is bizarre. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a state of affairs, I'm afraid. It, you know, until we get a politician who's actually got, a, you know, balls and who has a capacity to tell people how it is, things aren't going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. Anyway, Shooter Down Under asks, if you could change anything in the UK in regards to gun laws, what would it be? 
Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to assume you're trying to say something realistic. <laughs> um, if I was being realistic, what I would do, I would get rid of section 1 completely and I would have one basic firearms license and it would be under the principle of section 2, meaning that uh, it is the, uh, the burden of proof is upon the state to demonstrate a reason why you shouldn't own a firearm and that firearm being anything you like within reason, so handguns, semi-automatic rifles, etc or a shotgun, and they should have a good reason why you shouldn't have one. Uh, making you have a cabinet, etc., is probably pretty sensible, but the, the, but the, um, the onus, the sort of, sorry, the burden of proof should be on the government to say why you shouldn't have a firearm. The, the burden of proof shouldn't be upon you, as it is now with Section 1, to demonstrate why you should have one. So that's what I would, that's what I would change. Uh, Mr. Caboose VG asks, could you do a video to dispel the myth that shooting is an expensive sport and is only for toffs? That's a great idea, and I should do that. Um, it's not the easiest thing to demonstrate, but what I would say is you only need to go on something like the Pigeon Watch forums and see the thousands of people there talking about shooting and hunting who go shooting and hunting. And, um, and I hate to say it, a lot of them, you know, you can see how they speak and what they talk about in their lives and where they come from, it's very easy to see that these people are not posh by any means. Um, and I don't know where that idea comes from, frankly. It's, it seems very strange to me because, it, you know, sure, if you're doing grouse shooting in Scotland or deer stalking in Scotland or something, you probably are quite well off and all the rest of it. But the grassroots conservation and pest control um, and scale game shooting that goes on in the UK is very much um, a working class hobby you know or working class should I say maybe you know just normal people kind of hobby it's not a posh hobby posh people don't want to do vermin control and vermin control is that is, is by far the overwhelming majority of shooting that goes on so and, and small game shoots like small pheasant shoots so there we are yeah. um, Sonu Dilly asks who disliked this video? Probably one of the pigeons at the pig farm. Yeah, that's an interesting one, even though it's not re really a question directed at me, because obviously I don't know who disliked the video. But yeah, really weird. Um, I don't know if you, any of you guys have been following my Facebook group recently, but I did my... Um, I had a pigeon shooting video at the, at the pig farm where we go up, and it's my most popular video. And th three times now, I've been trolled by pigeon fanciers. Not antis, you know, these guys don't mind me shooting pigeons. But they just don't like anybody shooting feral pigeons because they're worried that a racing pigeon will get shot. And it's bizarre, really, because a racing pigeon that's in a flock of feral pigeons is never going to go back to its owner. And, you know, and it's eating crops. So, yeah, it, is t it isn't legal to shoot it. Obviously, that very rarely happens anyway, to be honest. It, it does happen sometimes, but very rarely. But... Even when it does happen, for it to be a crime, you know, there has to be a complaint, has to be made, and also there has to be a demonstration that was done intentionally, which would be impossible. And let's be honest, you know, what pigeon fancy wants their bird, would want that bird back? It's not, it doesn't want to come back, it's, it's gone off with feral pigeons, it's gone feral. So it's a moot point, really, but they do seem to be quite a militant bunch. <laughs> so it's quite surprising, yeah, keep an eye on those pigeon fanciers, because, yeah, they, you know, they like a good argument. Jordan McDowell asks, what full ball rifle are you thinking about getting and why? I've kind of asked, answered this already, so I won't go on about it. I want to get a 243 to shoot deer and fox, and I hope to do that soon. It's just a question of whether I want to compromise and buy something cheap and second hand, or I want to get what I really want, which is going to cost me 1,500 quid, maybe even 2,000 pounds, mostly because I want the right glass, but we shall see. Canon uh, 10985 asks, are you thinking of getting a 22LR semi-auto, and if so, which one? I must admit, at the moment, not really. Um, only because uh, Tom's already got a Smith & Wesson M&P 1522, if I want to have a laugh with that sort of gun. If I'm, going, if I'm shooting in a competition, 90% of the time, Tom will be there and, and will let me borrow his gun. And for any other sort of shooting, I have to say, you know, my, my Browning T-Bolt, it, it just feels you know, a million miles away in terms of quality compared to a semi-auto in terms of accuracy and, and in, in every other respect, really. So, you know, I've got nothing against them. Uh, maybe I would at some point, but I'm not in a hurry at the moment. Joe Randella asks, what would your dream animal be to go and hunt? Happy holidays. <laughs> um, well, probably boar. 
to be honest. I know that's a bit boring, but I mean, you see these a lot of guys in in Germany, especially in Austria and places like that, shooting driven bore. I mean, this obviously goes up onto the sort of my ideal rifle because, as I just said, I'm getting a 243 at some point. Hopefully, I would love to get a Blazer R8. You know, with that straight pull action and the swingability, specifically really for shooting things moving. I would love to go to Germany and do that to shoot driven bore as they're running with a um, with a, a rifle like that. That'd be fantastic. But maybe that'll come at some point. We shall see. Probably more likely to be Eastern Europe because it'll be cheaper. But we shall see. Callum uh, Hindhall asks, "What is your favourite uh, bird to shoot and eat, and why?" Merry Christmas, keep up the good work. Yeah, it's a difficult one in a way. Uh, overall, it's kind of a no-brainer, the humble wood pigeon. I love wood pigeons. I love the way, I mean, I love them as, as animals. I love the way they flirt with each other and at uh, the different times of the year and stuff. They're, they're adorable birds, really. And they're proper, you know, old English bird. And they're great to hunt because it's, it's not just about the shooting, which can be fantastic, but it's about you know, getting the wind direction right, getting the crops right, getting the hide in the right place, and you, you know, and it not still not always going right, but when it does go right, it is just fantastic shooting. However, I do love walked up pheasant shooting as well, because that's very, very exciting, and it's a nice big bird, and I do enjoy that too. But overall, yeah, definitely wood pigeon. Uh, Sonny Dilly asks, second question, uh, who owns rifle clubs? Um, is it the NRA or by individuals? And the, um, and the club kind of by is the club just by kind of by the NRA or is it owned by the government? Um, as far as I'm aware, the, there's all sorts of varieties. If I'm honest, um, you have I think I'm not, I don't even know. If I'm honest, I don't know for, for, for sure. Um, but there are clubs I think that are owned by the NRA. I think, um, but most clubs that I've seen have been like either cooperatives where they're a large group of people get together to make a club. My club's like that. It has been since it stopped being an army barracks in like the early 80s. Um, and that is basically a cooperative. And that's great actually, the way that works, because the club actually makes loads of money. It makes al almost more money than it knows what to do with. And um, so we end up with great facilities. Um, but yeah, there are private individuals who run clubs and all the rest of it. But in terms of who, who is controlling them, it's the government. I mean, they all have to be Home Office approved, and there's certain standards they have to adhere to. There's lots and lots of regulation, you know, so that's how it kind of works. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I, as I said, I think there's a lot of variety there. Sam uh, McClyman asks, What new rifles or shotguns are you hoping to own in the coming year? Merry Christmas. Um, I did sort of already answer this twice now. Um, it's really important when I do these questions and answers video to, to try and read through some of the other questions that have been asked because otherwise we get the same thing over and over again. So yeah, just read back. <laughs> um, Voodoo2762 asks, favourite shooting discipline, hunting clays, rifle, uh, rifles, shotguns, etc. Cheers. Hmm. Yeah, well, I would say when it's uh, really good, I love shooting on rimfire. And that will probably extend to the 243 when I get it. And it was on the 50 meter range, and obviously this is just practice for when I'm hunting, but the first five shots I literally got through the exact same hole, it was really satisfying. So my accuracy is getting really good now, so it, it's quite, yeah, it's really good to get headshots and things. I really quite enjoy the right rabbit shooting, and as I said, I'm sure that will extend to deer as time goes on. Okay, Robert Stubbings asks, hi. Asks, there's only uh, one truly important question AR 15 or AK 47? Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Um, I think it's pro I'll probably hands down, if I'm honest, say AR 15. Only because the ergonomics are so nice in every, every respect with an AR. Um, it's really balanced, it shoulders really well. You've got like the uh, bolt release here, you've got the mag release here. 
you know, you've got the charging handle um, here, meaning that, that there isn't a big gap somewhere for dust to get in. You've got the dust cover on the on the on the um, um, breech, so you know you can flip that up <clears throat> when you're walking around, and you know, so dirt doesn't get in it. It is a beautifully designed firearm, and it's a beautiful cartridge as well. I love the 223. I hate to say it, the AK, <coughs> much as they are obviously you know, very, very, very easy to use and take down. I mean, you can give it to an eight-year-old and without telling them anything, within 10 minutes, they know how to strip it and use it. It's so simple and they're really reliable and all, all the rest of it. But from personal experience, because I mean, I have shot both in strikeable configuration at my club, and I would say the AK-47 is horrible to shoot. It's the way it's designed, the stocks. I mean, obviously you can modify all these things, but the stocks tend to be really short. The um, sights are really far away, so you've got like too much eye relief. Your face is always too close to it. The cartridge is 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 quite loopy. You know, I, I'm not a fan. Having said that, if I was a soldier and I was going to war, I might think completely differently. Um, you know, because I do hear that the general war people give is, you know, the AK-47. Certainly in the Middle East, they would say if you're going street to street, the AK-47 wins hands down because it shoots through things and it's you know, the, the long sight picture allows you for quick target acquisition, etc. And the AR-15 in the, in the Middle East is thought of as almost like a sniper rifle, and it's something people would shoot from windows and things. It's not something for close up. So that tends to be the, the sort of consensus. But from personal experience, the AR-15 would win hands down every time, to be honest, certainly from a target shooting point of view, and certainly if I was going to hunt with them. So that's my view. Oliver Morrison asks, what's your favourite Ely game cartridges, cartridges to shoot with? Um, I suppose that's a difficult question in some respects because it depends on what you're planning on, what game you're, or, or vermin you're going to shoot. Um, but from the shooting I generally do, EVIP number 6 is a fantastic load. It's sort of relatively low recoil but, but really high velocity. Um, they're really nice to shoot. I really, really like EVIP. But they're really expensive. So it's not so, something I shoot very often. <coughs> Number one, I'm getting a sore throat. Why not? I am in France. Although I won't be by the time you watch this, probably. Wesley Brooker asks, Can you please do a video on muzzleloader ownership in the UK? Merry Christmas, keep up the videos. Unfortunately, I don't own a muzzleloader. Um, for my, excuse me smoking by the way, kids don't smoke, and I always say it, don't. It's stupid, that's why I'm having to smoke, because I can't know how old that one. But when I, when I joined my club and I had to do my um, uh, probation, they call it, which is just like training for like 10 weeks you have to do before you're allowed to become a member. One of the things they, you have to do now is, 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 is owning a muzzleloader because of how to operate a muzzleloader because of um, you know, things like you know, safety, basically. If you spill powder, what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to use it. Um, but yeah, muzzleloaders are quite good fun. Um, it takes a long time to shoot, obviously, but it makes you really think about that shot, and it's quite satisfying because you know you you might find you're aiming here and hitting here, so you're using sort of Kentucky windage or whatever, so you can you know you can get quite accurate with it, especially with smooth bore with a rifle. Um, it's it means if you want a rifle smooth bore, um, I think you can get that on a shotgun license. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's that's true, and it also means that. If you want a revolver, you can have just a regular revolver if it's muzzle loader. You don't have to have this silly armrest and long barrel, you can just have a standard one. And in fact, there are alternatives out there which are very modern looking revolvers that are muzzle loaders where you can get pre packaged lumps of lead and the right charge and stuff in a like, little packet and just, you know, and use it like a proper handgun as a way of almost getting around the handgun legislation. So, yeah, they're great. But I don't own one and I don't have one on my ticket at the moment. So. Nathan Smith asks, UK has Christmas? Well, I should do this in an American accent, really. Um, UK has Christmas? Who the hell knew? Are you trying to steal, steal Christmas from the USA? So it's a shit, shit uh, accent I've done there, isn't it? But uh, yeah, we do have it, actually, yes, yes. We were doing it for quite a long time before you were even, ex even existed. Before you were even an itch in our pants, I have to say. <laughs> so I don't mean to be facetious, but yeah, we, we do have Christmas, yes. Liam Clark asks, Hi, I'm, all, I'm in Australia. They have made a lever action shotgun called the S1000 Adler. Do you think they will sell them in the UK? Because I want one. And do you think they will ban 
the leave release action in the UK. Happy holidays. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. Um, I've seen that. It's really curious. The reason that gun exists in the States is because, for most people at least, as far as I'm aware, and I don't know the ins and outs of Australian firearms legislation, but as far as I'm aware, uh, pump action shotguns are effectively banned. I know people can get them, but on the, for a normal, regular person, they're banned. So to get around the law, they bring out a lever action. Um, but rather than being a lever action in the, in the conventional sense, where it actually opens sort of here, and... Sorry, kids. Shut up, Gabriel! Um, you run the lever, and as you run the lever, it just opens the breech a bit like a pump action. So it's always the best of both worlds, and obviously being like that, it's, it probably cycles better than a pump action, really. Um, and yeah, I think they're pretty cool. I'd have one, definitely. In terms of the lever release, um, it's weird. As far as I'm aware, when they first came out, the police were obviously like, oh shit, this is really getting around the law. And, but as far as I'm aware, I don't think they're really considered a problem now. <coughs> and given the public, the vast majority of the public wouldn't have a clue what they were or that they exist at all. So I can't see them being banned in it any time soon, unless, of course, some nutcase gets hold of one somehow and does anything bad with one, in which case they almost certainly will, because we live in this sort of ridiculous knee-jerk society. So people just ban things, just like, you know, straight away. So, we'll see. Cragoth McBrannell asks, Is that guy... I know this question, I saw this before, you cheeky git. <laughs> Is that guy you shoot with your partner or just a mate? Also, what's your favourite beer? Uh, no, he's not my, my partner, sexual or, or otherwise. Um, but, uh, but there'd be nothing wrong with that, of course, if he was. You know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, people being gay, that's fine. But no, we're not. Um, I have, we both have girlfriends and we're both living with them now, actually. Um, separately, might I add. <laughs> um, but I've known some since I was four years old. And uh, I actually had some sort of altercation with him, I think, at nursery school, and we've kind of been mates ever since, really. So, and, yeah, we both shoot, so that's why you see him a lot. So, yeah, he's always around. He's often here in France, actually, but he's not made it this year, so... There we are. Pest, uh, pest Control Pest Control asks, What's the best type of wild fowling, with a wild fowling cartridges for duck and geese for end of this, this season and next season? Keep up, the good video. Keep up with the videos, lad. Brilliant. Um, I would love to give you a really detailed opinion on that, but I really wouldn't have a clue because I don't shoot ducks and geese, generally speaking. I mean, obviously, obviously you need to use steel now, and EVIP is a brand that I found have been fantastic, so I would hazard a guess that if I was in the market for buying, especially like three inch like goose loads, I probably would be buying, you know, number one or number three, or whatever it is people use, steel shot EVIP. But I really don't know enough about it to tell you if that's anything better than anything else, because I'm sure lots of people got lots of opinions out there. So by all means, you know, you guys, you know, if you know more about it than me, let me know what you think. Blue Bottle 001. Hi Sam, what's your view on eye protection for shooting? Also, do you think that we as shooters are being exploited given that shooting glasses are usually over 40 pounds when screw fix uh, today but one shot is selling uh, impact resistance specs for a tenner cheers for the great videos loving the channel keep up the good work happy new year um, and to you mate uh, i think my rule i would always advocate at any club playground or shooting you know shooting club always always wear eye protection most shooting clubs like mine would basically say you know you have to wear hearing protection we really recommend eye protection, but that's up to you, unless you're in a shotgun pit and then you've got to wear it. I would say you'd be insane not to wear eye protection anywhere where there's lots of other people shooting because there's the potential for, for you know, all sorts of things could happen. In a clay ground, for instance, you might um, be hitting the eyes with a stray bit of clay, that's you know, a, a clay pigeon that's, that's been hit and a bit fragment might hit you in the eye. And, and also for that reason, always wear a peaked cap as well. In fact, when I was shooting over Christmas with my girlfriend at a local clay ground, there was a guy walking on holding his head with a big gash because he had been hit by a stray clay. So it does happen. Um, if you're hunting, uh, if I don't generally wear eye protection at all because uh, both the guns I shoot, generally speaking, well, no, in fact, all the time, are closed bolt. 
So if it's my pump action, if it's my over and under shotgun, if it's my uh, bolt action straight pull rifle, it's, it's, it's a, a fixed breech. So short of the gun exploding, which I suppose could happen, you know, I suppose it could. It's not very likely because I don't load my own loads, but it could happen. But it's very unlikely, so I don't generally bother because I do find glasses to get in the way of it. Uh, but if you're shooting a semi-automatic or a self-loading rifle, you really should because you can get gases and bits of debris coming out of the breech as you fire. So it's a good idea to do that. That's why so you'll see Tom because he always fires his Maxus out pigeon shooting. Tom always wears eye protection. In terms of the cost though, I think you need to look a bit harder because if you want to set up Beretta glasses, yeah, really expensive. But if you look at a brand called Top Gun, in fact I'll put a link to that in the description, um, Top Gun for about 30 or 40 pounds, maybe more like 30 actually, I'll, I'll have to check, on, on Amazon you can buy a full set of glasses, I think it's like six pairs, and they're individual pairs of glasses as well, with all the different colours, and yeah, they're, they're, yeah, it's only about 30 pounds, and that's quite a number of, of pairs, and they're every bit as good as any, anything you'd get from Beretta, um, or otherwise. And a lot of the companies you get will have um, the glasses, and the actual glasses themselves will have the spare lenses, and, uh, but with Top Gun you will get spare sets of glasses. So, yeah, they're not as expensive as you think, so shop around, and that's, as I said, that's a good brand. In fact, my shooting bag, you may have seen my cartridge bag I use, that's also Top Gun, and that's a, that's a very, good, um, very good bag as well. So, yeah, keep your eyes open. Uh, here we go. Henry Williams asks, what's your pr uh, opinion on the Bretta S687 Silver Pigeon? Um, I don't really have an opinion over, overly, um, I don't even know what specific model that is. The Bretta Silver Pigeon generally, from what I've seen, is a very good gun, very pretty gun as well. Um, the only thing I would say to its detriment, like most things made in Italy, the build quality isn't anything like as good as a Browning, and I'm not just being a fanboy there, I don't, really don't think it is. But being a Bretta is very good, I mean all Bretta guns are very very good indeed, to be honest, so you won't, you won't go wrong with a Beretta. Anything else Italian though, like a Rosini, anything like that, I would think twice. In fact, um, when we went to the Breeden School Fate and Festival of Shooting last year, uh, Tom went into a competition with their uh, school's challenge guys, um, hi you lot, you, some of you are probably watching, and he shot a Rosini with like a 34 inch barrel, which is really long, and it was brand new, and when he opened it, it creaked. Because you know, the build quality was crap, and, and that seems to be a lot, happen a lot with Italian guns. Just like with Italian cars, you know, where uh, Fiat's or even Ferraris, they might be very pretty, but my God, the build quality isn't really what I would choose personally. So, yeah, there we are. Terry R asks, I'm looking at buying my first shotgun and can't decide whether to buy a cheap one to get started or get a more expensive one that will last. Um, well, it comes down to how much money you've got, really, to be honest. As, as, as a wise man once said, you know, buy cheap, buy twice. Um, if you do buy a cheap shotgun, there's a good chance you'll want to end up buying a more expensive one further down the road, and you might wish that you'd kept the money that you spent on the cheap ones to put towards a more expensive one. But like with any shotgun, whether it's cheap or expensive, For all round shooting and why? Having crap on Christmas and a happy new year. Um, well, for all round shooting, well, I mean, tell us what you define as all round, but uh, for general, for the quarry, both of those guns generally are four, I would always go with a 2 2 long rifle, only because it's really cheap to shoot um, and it's, it can be silent if you want it to be. And also, you know, it's easier to get because most. Police jurisdictions won't mind with the first application for a firearm certificate to issue with a 2 2 long rifle. But a 70 HMR, for use in the field at least, often they'll want you to have experience the same way they do with the centre fire. Obviously, the advantage with the 70 HMR is you can shoot foxes with it. You can shoot foxes with a 2 2, um, but 
for reasons I'm not going to go into now, the police don't really like using a tutu for foxes. So it's a tool for the job, really. Um, you know, I would be inclined to go with a tutu, but the 17 HMR is a fantastic round. So whatever you prefer, really. Brian Shim, what is your best day ferreting, and when are you going out next? Keep up your good work. Um, I'm not sure, really. I mean, I've, I mean, obviously, you've seen videos I've done recently. I haven't done ferreting to any extent since I was a boy, really. But there were occasions as a, as a boy where, you know, we would get 10, 11 rabbits in the day, and we've had some fantastic days. But if I'm really honest with you, I couldn't tell you when the best day I had was. So, yeah, maybe it's still to come. So keep your eyes open. Might actually get some ferreting after Christmas. Um, you know, when I go back, so we, we shall see, we shall see. Hunting, Ar no, Hunting Ireland asks, do you have any deer calibre rifles? If so, um, what are they? And if, and if not, are you thinking of doing any deer stalking? Kind of grass, David. Um, yeah, as I just said, the same question again. I want to get a 243, I don't have one at the moment. It could cost me a lot of money, so we shall see. But yeah, I really do want to do some deer stalking, and I would like to shoot boar at some point if I can. So, yeah. EGL110 asks, Hi Sam, Merry Christmas to you and to all your subscribers. This new law the EU is trying to um, bring banning all combat stroke assault looking firearms. Okay. If I purchased an AR-15 type semi-auto and T2LR before the ban, then it did come into force in the future. What do you think would happen to it? Would I have to hand it in? Could I keep The danger with this new legislation coming in, banning self-loading rifles that are military looking, as it was proposed, did mean that potentially, if it had been left completely unchallenged, it really could have meant that guns like Tom Smith and Western M&P 1522 could have been banned. Yes, it could have happened. But, as I predicted at the time, which is why I didn't get too overexcited about it at the time, um, is that I knew, I knew that it wouldn't go unchallenged and it would be watered down. And in fact, it's funny because some of the biggest proponents of this legislation are coming from the UK, people like David Cameron, and it's funny because, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't think our, our legislation would change, and he thinks it's a way of making us look cool, because we, you know, apparently we're great at firearms law. So I don't think that the UK government would be, would really swallow any changes, to be honest, in terms of, in terms of that. I don't, I don't see it happening, really. If it does happen, if it did happen, and they did ban them, um, you would think, like in America, any reasonable government would say, okay, if you've already got one, you can keep it, but you can't buy any more. Um, I very much doubt that would happen. I think in the UK, if that did happen, which I don't think it will, but if it did, you would probably have to hand it in and it would probably get crushed. But you probably would get compensation, in which case you wouldn't really be wasting your money. So go for it, basically. Buy one. Uh, sorry about the background noise, by the way, if you can hear any, we've got kids running around. I've tried to sort of you know, make them shut up, but <laughs> kids aren't they? Um, here we go. Ryan Hutchison asks, what's the best way to go about getting uh, pigeon shooting permission? Um, I've done a video on this. Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but look through my playlist. There's, yeah, I've done a video on how to get shooting permissions. There's no easy answer. It basically comes down to networking. You need to be insured and just don't come across as a weirdo and don't go knocking on someone's door covered in camo gear with a shotgun over your arm and say can I go shooting because that really won't get you anywhere uh, get to know people and you'll be surprised what comes along basically so Terry R asks I think you've already asked the question but never mind would you recommend a semi also or over and under um, the trouble is with something like that it's completely subjective it depends what you like depends what suits you I would, what I would um, recommend is that you have a lesson and you have a go at shooting both and then make your own decision, really. Personally, I don't like shooting semi-autos at all. Um, I would actually prefer to shoot a um, pump action over a semi-auto, if I'm honest, even though I do forget to pump it sometimes. But I like them because it is a solid lock-up when you're shooting the gun. Um, I don't like semi-autos because I don't like the movement when you're shooting them. I find it really disconcerting and weird. Um, but that's just for me, you know, and it's, I'm sure if I shot them for ages, I'd probably feel differently. Um, but it really comes down to personal preference. So just have a go with both and see how you feel.
really. Smug Barbecue asks, Hi buddy, hope you have a good, uh, a good one this year, and all the best for next year. If you could sit in a hide or go shoot anyone in the world, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Thanks. And keep up the good work for our community, dude. You really do uh, always put a positive image out for us shooters. Um, cheers, mate. Um, yeah, that's a funny one, isn't it? Uh, I probably wouldn't shoot, choose a shooter, if I'm honest, because, you know, in a pigeon hide, you want to have a chat, don't you? <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you what I find really interesting to go pigeon shooting, who I'd go pigeon shooting with, and that'd be Noam Chomsky. I'd probably end up having a massive argument with him about lots of things, and we probably wouldn't get much shooting done. And also, he'd probably be a crap shot, and he probably wouldn't like it very much. But I'd probably enjoy that. I do actually greatly admire Noam Chomsky. Look him up if you don't know who he is. He's um, a almost the world's uh, reference to, to linguistics. And if you like arguing, which I do, you often will find what you end up arguing about, no matter what the subject is, you're really arguing about what, the, what words mean. And obviously, being, being uh, a linguist, um, that's quite important. And he does obviously do a lot of, um, he's a great modern historian and he talks a lot about subjects which I find very interesting. I don't agree with everything he says by any means, but he's very well read and I would find it interesting. So yeah, it would probably be him. US Mail 9-11-2001 asks, are you drinking Bath's Ale? Merry Christmas. No, I'm drinking... Coates de Rhone, I think, at the moment, uh, <laughs> but I assume you're talking about when I did the questions video, which obviously is what you commented in. Um, I hate to say it, I think I was just drinking Carly, which is disgraceful, really. Um, I should drink proper beer, but to be honest, I like, I like cheap beer most of the time. Crookio one asks, is it okay to dry fire a modern over and under shotgun? I feel it's damaging to dry fire any gun. Is this correct, thanks? Um, I don't think it matters, to be honest. Everyone says that. Everyone also says, not well, everyone, but lots of people do say, you should put snap caps in your gun. Which, uh, For those who don't know, a snap cap is like a fake shotgun cartridge with a sort of spring next to a fake primer, and you put them in the gun and you shoot it twice and put it away so you've got, you know, so the, so the hammers aren't back when you put it away. Um, and, you know, yeah, people say don't drive fire them. I've drive fire my gun plenty of times. I don't intentionally drive fire my gun. It's not something I would do regularly by any means. Um, but to be honest, I don't think it really matters. Even my rim fire, and, you know, everyone is quite commonly known not to drive fire a rim fire because the firing pin doesn't go into the centre, so it doesn't just go into the air when it goes off. It actually hits the metal of the, of the, uh, the breech because it goes to hit the rim of the cartridge. And... Uh, Therefore, obviously, you know, you could damage a firing pin, but let's be honest, firing pins don't cost a lot of money. So if it did break, and it probably won't, it's not a big deal. And to be honest, I've dry fired my rim fire as, as well, you know, loads of times by accident because I've run out, I've been on the last shot of the magazine at the club and, you know, it's not done any harm, to be honest. I don't think it's a big deal these days. If you've got an old gun, probably be more mindful, but yeah, just don't make a habit of it, basically. Harry Plant asks, Hi Sam, what's your opinion on shoot shooting clothes, e.g. tweed? Is it necessary, necessary and do you own any? I don't own any... Oh, Merry Christmas and, and to you too, mate. Um, <laughs> certainly not necessary. I think there are lots of materials which are better. In fact, my girlfriend bought me a pair of Beretta shooting trousers for Christmas and they're fantastic. I'm really looking forward to trying them out. They're so nice, in fact, that I'm a bit worried about getting them covered in mud, but, you know, there we are. Tweed, though, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like old-fashioned camo, isn't it, really? Um, it, but it does look really cool, and if my pockets are a lot deeper, uh, or maybe when they're a lot deeper, I will probably get a full suit of tweed, and it'll, it'll probably be so nice, I probably won't want to wear it shooting, unless I've gone on a pheasant shoot or something, and I've paid lots of money. Um, so, yeah, there we are. Tom's got a bit of tweed, though. He bought a tweed jacket not long ago. So, yeah, I might get some at some point. Alan Duncombe asks, what was your best day shooting with a rimfire or shotgun and why? And have a Merry Christmas. Um, with the rimfire, and certainly in recent times, I would say my best day shooting was when, and you'll see it if you look through my 
rabbit shooting play or my room fire shooting playlist. Uh, I shot a rabbit at about 65 yards, something like that, straight through the head, standing. And I was really, really pleased with that shot. I got another couple of rabbits that day. Um, so yeah, in recent times, that was probably not my best day. That was really good. In terms of pigeon shooting, it's hard to say because there's different ways of judging it. Um, but I would say that uh, it's probably, in terms of the bag and in terms of almost amusement, I would say um, the video I did on, I think it was called uh, Feral Pigeon Shooting. And I got about 44 birds that day. And it was particularly special because I had never before in my life ever shot two birds with one shot before. And that day I shot two birds with one shot twice and unbelievably I managed to shoot three birds with one shot on one occasion. It was insane. So yeah, that was that. Um, you need to excuse me for just a moment because I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to go and shout at some children to get them to be quiet. So I'll be right back. Pigeon Fishing Channel asks, uh, which do you prefer to shoot shotguns, air rifles or rifles? I would say in recent times I'd say probably shotguns only because I do that a lot more and I have more opportunities to just have better days and that sort of thing. Um, but I do love to shoot my rimfire, um, you know, because, you know, I'm a lot better at it, basically. Air rifles lately, not quite so much. Obviously, air rifles are very versatile. You can use air rifles for, for, for all sorts of things, but obviously when you've got other options available, then you're more likely to to go with that. Um, like certainly things like rabbit shooting, etc. You might go for the rimfire. So I'd say certainly at the moment I'll say shotguns. So Mike Cannon asks, "Hi Sam, love the channel. Just wondering, what's your view on small red dot sights for shotguns shooting birds like Burris Fastfire Three? As due to a wrist injury, I can't get on with conventional stocks. To have to have a pistol grip stock, but my gun has." Um, Host ring sights. I was thinking that a small red dot would more work more like a red bead sight. Cheers, thanks, and keep up the good work. Oh, sorry, correction, ghost ring sights. Yeah, sitting on ghost ring sights. I don't understand why people put ghost ring sights on a shotgun. It seems to be a, an Americanism. I guess it's like a tactical thing. But I don't understand that either. I mean, if you watch channels like you know, James Jager's channel and people like that are all into this sort of tactical sort of stuff. Um, and they always have two sets of sights, like ghost, a ghost string of some sort, or a T sight and a foresight. And all that tells me is they don't really know anything about shotguns, because it might surprise some of you guys who are just game shooters, but if you do do tactical shooting, it shouldn't surprise you, but the same principles apply, exactly the same. You don't want ghost string sights, you don't want a red dot sight, you don't want any kind of sights other than the bead, because you shoot the gun just the same way as you would if you were shooting the bird on the wing. Unless, of course, you're shooting slugs, but even with slugs, it's not necessarily a, you know, a requirement. I mean, I can see an advantage, but you, don't really, you still don't really need them. Um, certainly shooting birds on the, ring, on the wing, um, I would say it was a bad idea, because you need to have both eyes open, and you, you don't want something that's going to inhibit your view, and having like a piece of metal around your sight picture isn't going to be the best thing. But... Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to ergonomics at the end of the day, so if it works for you, well, I guess, I guess, try it. But I certainly wouldn't see it as a preference. So, so there we are, really. Toby Crawford asks, Hi, we'd love to know what cartridges you use and what gram. Also, what chokes, thanks. Um, most of the time, I use 30 grams of uh, number 6.5 Ely Pigeon uh, with a fibre wad. And I use the classic game chokes, which is um, modified in the bottom and improved modified on the top, obviously starting with the bottom barrel. That's pretty much what I use across the board. And that will do you for, for almost any situation, to be honest, um, unless you're going for ducks or geese or something like that. Even foxes and stuff, to be honest, if they're at reasonable ranges, that would still do the job. So that's what I go for. I would probably prefer to use EV VIP number six, but they're really expensive, so I don't. Um, Sonny Diddy asks, again another question from you Sonny, um, if you've got an FAC to shoot at a club, can you then go um, and use those firearms at your permissions or do you have to notify your FEO? 
because I know that you have to go to other clubs as a guest without notifying anyone except the club, or is this not right? Um, yeah, if you're a club shooter, um, yeah, you can you can go as a guest to other clubs. That isn't a problem because that's what you've been granted. Um, if you want to shoot on private land, that's a different case entirely. The land for for a staff has to be checked, um, and it has to be checked that the land is suitable for the calibre of the firearm that you want to use upon it. So, um, you know, most of my permissions are cleared for up to 243, and that is almost laziness on the part of the FEO, because frankly, if a, if a piece of land is alright for a 243, it should be fine for a 30 cal as well. But because they know most people go for a 243 for hunting, that's just what they choose to put down, basically, which can be daft. Um, there can be some issues with that um, when you put down your application that you want to be a, you know, shoot on a permission. Because, I mean, although the land's probably been checked, you'd be surprised if you shoot on a farm, chances are the land's already been checked because it's usually checked once every 10 years. So you will probably find if you're an air gunner, say, or shotgun shooter and you're going for your FAC, the land that you're shooting on is probably, that you do probably don't need to get it checked. Um, however, if you're shooting a centre fire, or often even a 17 HMR for a lot of police jurisdictions, they will insist that you're mentored and that you have somebody who's already got a centre fire or, or, or a 17 HMR and that they are willing to sign something effectively to say that they've taken you out for a day and let you have a go with their gut, which in itself, ironically, is spurious legally. You know, it might not be quite, it, it's, it's not necessarily 100% legal for you to even do that, but that's what they tend to, tend to ask you. So, but you know, certainly for a 2-2 long rifle, generally speaking, they're okay about it, as long as you've got permission and the land is cleared, but you do need to tell them. Alex B asks, how often do you clean your firearms? Any particular all sorts of solvents do you use? Um, with my shotgun, I use it, I clean it every time I use it. Although I say that, it does do it going to be harm sometimes to put to not clean it if you're you know you're gonna shoot it again the next day or something like that. If it's like a weekend stint, then I might not clean it till the end of the weekend. Um, but it is important because you know you can get moisture on it, that sort of thing, while you're out without realising it. So it's it's just a really good rule of thumb to give it a clean. I generally use Napier um, products, I use Napier gun oil, um, the spray, and the Napier uh, ball cleaner. Um, and I find Napier to be really good, to be honest, for, for everything. In terms of my rim fire, um, I have a pull through, and it's funny because some people with rim fires don't ever clean them, and you always get varying opinions. Um, but with mine, I have a pull through, and you know it only takes a second, to be honest. You just pull it through once, and it's just, just done. Um, in terms of the rest of the gun, you don't really need to clean it, to be honest, although every so often I have a wipe down. And every so often, this is an important one. I mean, I've already gone into this with my, I've done cleaning videos before. Um, but certainly every, every so often with a shotgun, say maybe once a year, um, take the chokes out, clean them. Again, I've done a video on doing that. Um, but the big thing is before you put them back in, grease the threads before you put, put them back in. Because otherwise, if it goes a long time without them coming out, if any moisture does get in there, they can see shut. And the same goes for your rimfire. If you've got a silencer, every so often, doesn't have to be that often, but every so often take the silencer off, um, give the end of the barrel a good oil down, and again, grease the threads before you put, put it back on because again I've heard a lot of times with people who've, who've had a rim fire and they've just left the silencer on and they've never taken it off and um, they come to then take it off one day and it's sealed, it's seized on because a little bit of rust has got in there so um, yeah that's probably the biggest thing to really wa watch to be honest is just to grease your threads. Uh, Gamekeeper75 asks, hi Sam if you had unlimited, uh, if you had unlimited money and could buy any shotgun you wanted what would it be and why? Great videos, by the way. Keep them coming, thanks. Um, well, if I had limited money, I'd probably buy a Purdy or a Holland Holland. Um, it, which one specifically? Uh, it really depends on what I like the look of and the fit, if I'm honest. I suppose if it was anything. I suppose, yeah, I mean, if it was any budget, I, w I would um, go to Holland Holland or Purdy and I would have them fit me a gun and, and make it exactly for me. That's what I would do. Um, and if I could, I'd get them to also fit me with a suit of, not a nice tweed suit as well to go with it. But uh, I can't see that happening anytime soon, to be honest, money because of the expense of that. Um, Freddie Walton asks, what, if any, ear protection do you use? Again, I've done a video on this. I use Entech um, ear defenders, which are moulded plugs, and they've got like a little a, a sort of valve 
so you know you can hear until there's a loud bang and then it closes off and they're fantastic but they're not you know any better than any other similar sorts of plug but i would recommend if you shoot to not read that's one thing you shouldn't skimp on because you know you only get one set of ears and um if you do damage your hearing there is you know you are not going to get that back so it's really important that you that you take that seriously and if you spend 100 pounds on a set of ear defenders like molded plugs it's an investment well worth making i highly recommend it and yeah what brand you go with is up to you but i really recommend it because you know you will be glad you did it real or sam name asks what do you think about jeremy corbyn and do you ever meet up with a german kid from the last questions video just found your channel this morning and i've been binge watching all day great content to keep up the good work I did meet up with a German kid, um, I don't think he's commented that much since then, as far as I know. Um, and Jeremy Corbyn, I think he's got the best of intentions, I think he's got a lot of integrity. I think it's unfortunate that he isn't very intelligent, if I'm honest, and I think it's unfortunate that he has very little charisma. And I think it's especially unfortunate from my point of view that for, that for his shadow cabinet he decided to appoint his shadow environment minister um, as with using the ex-president of the League Against Cruel Sports. I think he's very naive and very ignorant and as I said not very bright and it's, it's unfortunate because he does have integrity, he does mean what he says, he just doesn't, he, he just writes, he, you know, his ego writes checks that he, his brain really can't cash, unfortunately, for lots of people because, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not really agreeing with most of his politics but i would have a lot of respect for him if i thought he was a very charismatic you know whatever leader but he just isn't sadly he's certainly not what the left needs they need to, need to really try a lot harder than that to be honest ben reynolds asks why don't you get a bigger rifle um again i am going to get a bigger rifle but money is an issue i've gone through this so you know just look back john hall asks would you ever shoot with a side-by-side? -side? Um, and someone's replied to that. Um, Sam McClymont said he does sometimes with his dad. And that's true, I do sometimes with my dad. I don't tend to get on with side-by-sides only because I find um, there's even less cant on the stock than you get with an over and under, and a lot less than a semi-auto or a pump. And because of that, because I do have quite a long neck, and you know, it's really hard for me to to get behind it. And the other thing I don't like about side-by-side -side is your hands tend to come around the gun like this. And that's why you see a lot of people with like a leather, you can buy like a leather thing that goes around the barrels to protect your hands when it heats up because that's not what happens to a lot of people. And I also find them a bit too light, if I'm honest. I like a heavy gun. Um, so yeah, that's why. But I've got nothing against them, you know, and I think they're very pretty. I think actually I would like a side-by-side -side at some point just because I think they're very pretty guns and I quite like one but I don't get on with them terribly well, if I'm honest. Friggy asks, how old were you when you, first, when you shot your first animal? Um, I think I was asked that in the last questions and answers video I did, and uh, like with that, I don't really remember. Um, maybe eight or something? Don't know. I don't know, something like that. It'll probably be when I was out with my brother with the old BSAS porter, shooting feral pigeons and magpies and crows and that sort of thing at this farm. That's no longer really a farm, actually, but um, yeah, be about that. The pigeon shooting ch channel asks again, which would you, which you rather go on a thousand bird pheasant shoot or a 50 bird? Uh, I'll probably say a thousand bird only because I'll probably be more likely to hit some. <laughs> um, really, I've not really got preference as long as I have a good day, and I suppose that all comes down to your shooting that day and all the other things. Average man asks, hmm, come here to watch shooting unsubscribe. That is a million like this. Well, to be honest, if you don't like it, mate, you know, <laughs> go somewhere else. I, I don't really care, to be honest. It's up to you. That's fine. That's not a problem for me. Ryan Marr asks, if you, if you could own one firearm you couldn't in the UK, what would it be and why? Happy Christmas. Um... I would probably be inclined to go for um, some sort of self-loading handgun, um, 
a Glock or, or something like that. I particularly like 1911s, I think they're very pretty. Um, but having said that, I do love, I do have a strong appreciation, I do love the, the utilitarianness, if that's a word, of something like a Glock 17 or a Glock 19. Um, I think they're fantastic as a piece of engineering um, and obviously, yeah, they'd be great for to shoot. So I'd love to have that. Sam Jenkins asks, what's your favourite gun make and why? Merry Christmas. Well, I don't know how many of you have noticed going by like the fact that all my guns are basically a Browning and my hat's Browning. I'm quite a bit of a Browning fanboy. I do love Browning. Um, but, you know, I'm well aware there's lots of better makes out there, so it's a question of affordability, really. But I do love a Browning. Um, I think Browning got a big advantage with off-the-shelf guns based on the fact that their guns are made in the Maruki factory in Japan because the build quality is fantastic. And whilst, as I said before, Beretta make very, very nice shotguns, in the price bracket, when you compare the build quality of a Beretta to a Browning, the, the Beretta really doesn't come close in terms of the, the fit and finish. I mean, my gun has had thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds thrown now, and it's still slightly stiff to open. It's still like a new gun. It really is. Um, so it's very high tolerances. So, yeah, for the price, I, I, I don't think you could fault a Browning, to be honest, whatever type of Browning it is, you know, whether it's a rifle or a shotgun. Um, Jack Morrison asks, can we expect some deer hunting vids? Also, it would be awesome if you could see more equipment reviews, optics, at guns, etc. Um, yeah, as I said, if, if and when I get the 243 in the near future, you certainly will be seeing some deer shooting vids. I must admit, I haven't seen any deer at my one permission for a while, but there definitely are some roe deer around there, and yeah, I would like to shoot one of those at some point. So watch this space, that's all I can say. Uh, also, in the, oh, sorry, in the equipment reviews. Um, I generally sometimes review stuff that I've bought, but you know, if there's a company out there and wants to send me some freebies, I'm more than happy to review it. So go go right ahead. Uh, Ezzy Kyle Twelve asks, "What is it like buying a suppressor? What is, it, what is it like buying a suppressor in the UK? The US is passing a bill that will make them non-NFA, more like European way of buying them. What is the European way? Well, it's very confusing. I think some people have." made similar comments to what I'm about to say underneath. Um, it's very confusing in the UK because certainly from a so socially, most people who are even anti-gun don't really have a problem with suppressors. Like any right-thinking person, they think of them as a no-brainer really because it's just polite. Um, so why wouldn't you? And obviously from a hunting perspective, they're great and all the rest of it. In terms of buying them, the police expect you to, have, even as a club shooter, the police have no problem with you buying a, su a, a, a suppressor of some sort. Um, but the, what's strange about the law is that you can buy um, a suppressor for an air rifle maybe on a half inch UNF thread over the counter as long as you're over 18 anyone can buy one and that same suppressor will happily screw onto a UNF thread on a 2.2 rimfire or I suppose a 2.2.3 uh, you know, even um, without a problem at all but the minute you do that you're breaking the law because in the UK, if you want to have a suppressor or a silencer, as they're called legally, um, on a Section 1 rifle, that suppressor has to be a slot on that licence. But if you just want to buy, a, buy one on its own and put it on an air rifle, well, yeah, that's fine, you don't need a licence at all. So our laws are quite strange for some reason. But yes, I have heard about, in America, them the potentially changing the laws, and good luck with that, because it's daft. Really, isn't it? Yes, to be honest, especially in America, because you know you can have almost any gun you like. So why would you restrict a suppressor? It's very strange to me. But there we are. Uh, Kong Choi asks, "Can you do a video on suppressor laws in the UK, please?" <laughs> yeah, I've just been asked that. Um, I can do. You know, if there's a lot of you, if you guys over the pond in America and you want to hear about that, by all means, just let me know, and I I will think about doing a doing a video on it. You know, I suppose I could do a comparison video between having it on and not having it on and um, I said there's an app for your phone you can get now, isn't there? So you can measure the decibels and stuff. So I could do something like that. So, you know, let me know what you think on that. If it's actually our American audience, because I think that's it would appeal to them a lot more. So yeah, let, let me know and I will think about maybe doing something for you. Dex Truce asks, and this is the last question. When will you be visiting the free states of America? Have you given any serious thought to leaving the country that's so 
furious on restraining your freedoms. Uh, yeah, I have, and I would love to go to America before too long. I really do plan to. Um, I have been to America before. I went to New York, um, but that's like, God, more than 10 years ago now. And uh, I have been thinking a lot, actually, about emigrating to the States. The problem is, from a UK perspective, um, or in fact, any non, you know, any people wanting to get to America, it is very, very difficult to get into America. So, if any of you guys out there on, in the States want to give me a job, I'm an, I'm, a, uh, I'm an IT guy, so I do like, a lot of project management and stuff, so if you want to give me a job, let me know but I'll be straight over there. Short of that, I'm assessing my options really, because you might notice where I am now, my mum owns this house in north of France, and obviously being a European citizen, I can move here if I want to, and she would be happy for me to move here and not charge me any rent, basically, as long as I cover the bills. So it is a consideration, actually, moving to France, because at least in France you can have self-loading rifles and, and handguns if you want, and this great, great shooting really in this area, and we have a lot of French friends around here. In fact, my friend Claude is the president of the local shooting society and shoots a lot of boar and that sort of thing. Um, the only thing that's really stopping me is finding the right job, because... It isn't a hugely wealthy area here, so I need to find somewhere where I can earn plenty, you know, certainly at least the same money as I am in England. And I also need to really brush up on my French, because my French is crap. So it's something I'm thinking about, but the States, yeah, would be fantastic. So, you know, any of you guys, make me an offer, you know, and I will certainly consider it. So there we are. Um, that's about that now. Um, my missus is just actually taking the kids out somewhere because of the noise, um, but they'll be back imminently. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I know it was quite soon after the last questions and answers video, but it just gave me a chance while I'm sat here and you know having a glass of wine and not, not much else going on, just to give you something for the new year. But happy new year. I hope you guys have a really good one. And um, you know all the things that you hope to come true this year if you do, I hope they do for me as well. So I will see you all soon. And there'll be plenty more shooting to come. I have got a special video on 24 shotguns in the works at the moment. I nearly shot it over Christmas, but because of, of, of weather and, weirdly, an inability to get decent-sized um, Argos catalogs, I couldn't shoot it because they're that thick over, over Christmas. And obviously they should be like that. So that's in the works. So keep your eyes open for that one. So either way, as I said, like and subscribe.